tonight a Dateline special on Fiji. On May the 14th this year, a Fijian army officer named Ram Booker took over his country by ousting a democratically elected government. The politician he supplanted, Dr Timothy Bavandra, had been in power for four weeks. Just over four months later, when the first coup looked like running out of steam, Sitaveni Rambuka staged another one and declared Fiji a republic. A country most Australians think of as a tranquil holiday resort is now a military dictatorship. How did it happen and who else was involved? Dateline's Wendy Bacon reports. citizens and peoples of Fiji. As you may have probably heard or know, the Royal Fiji Military Forces have today at 4 p.m. reasserted its authority over the government of Fiji and reassumed executive authority which had been in the hands of His Excellency the Governor General. It was my intention to see that the Constitution of Fiji would forever enshrine and safeguard the paramountcy of the interests of the Toke in his homeland. It's for God and the rights of Fiji's indigenous people that Colonel Sitaveni Rambuka has turned his country into a military state. And since, without his approval, nothing can happen, that's the only public message which Fijian people are now receiving. <laughs> It's a message aimed at the anxieties of a people whose culture has been battered, first by British colonialism and now by modern capitalism. It's a racial interpretation of events that has been accepted by many foreign politicians and promoted by the world's press. But look a little deeper, shift your eyes off centre stage, and for a crusade fought in the name of Fijian rights, you find some strange characters in the wings characters which include Rod Kelly, a metal worker from Melbourne, Paul Freeman, a Suva businessman who's been receiving assistance from a United States government agency, Geoffrey Reed, chairman of Emperor Gold Mines, which has two joint ventures in Fiji with Australia's Western Mining, Peter Stinson, until this year Minister for Economic Development in Fiji, Richard Cyrus, just retired from the United States Navy Special Warfare Unit. And a mysterious worker from the United States Peace Corps in Fiji, Bill Derringer. All of these men are white. Each of them has recently meddled in Fijian politics. None were happy when in April this year, the Fiji Labor Party, in coalition with the National Federation Party, took over government. That ended 17 years of Conservative Alliance Party rule by Ratu Sakamasisi Mara. The legacy of those 17 years was a frustrated Fijian people, a legacy of uneven development. For while the Fijian people still own their land, most commoners have seen little return from its exploitation. So much so that even some of Fiji's senior chiefs were blaming the Fijian-dominated Alliance government. Is race any part of the problem that's going on at the moment? Race is not a part of the problem. You said means to be inefficiency, political inefficiency. Well, that is at the heart of the problem. But even the hardships of village life were preferable to the disappointments of urban life. An Alliance government wage freeze in 1984 led to a further fall in living standards. This became even harder to tolerate as the disparity in wealth grew more obvious. Not only poorer Fijians, but also poorer Indians had little hope of advancement in Suva's tight business community. It was with this division 
between those who flourished and those who could not, that the new Fiji Labour Party directed itself. The water supply, the, the homes that we have here and that kind of thing, that, those are the things that we need. We don't need training in military. We are concerned about you and we want to help you. We are concerned that the gap between you and the rich, we should narrow this by getting, get, rechanneling resources from there to here. That is what we want to do. But Bavandra never got the chance. In April this year, he won just enough indigenous Fijian voters to bring the coalition to power. As his ministers made their first decisions, the mood was optimistic. As it turned out, five weeks was all they had to implement their policies. The events which snuffed out those policies can be traced to the Tavua Valley, the home of the Vatikula gold mine, jointly owned by the Australian company Western Mining and Emperor Mines, a company based in the Isle of Man tax haven. Just six days after the coalition victory, the local chief here, known as the Tui Tavua, began a campaign against the Bavandra government. He instructed 70 of his people to set up roadblocks. All 70, as well as the Tui himself, were charged. Not charged, but also present that day, was Ratumara's close friend, Emperor Mines chairman, Geoffrey Reed. He was noticed by some of the residents whose identity has to be protected for security reasons. The day they had the roadblock, I was around the place and uh, he came around with uh, we call Yangona, Kava, and he supplied the, those Fijian people with Kava. Even before the roadblock, they had some party and things like that. And even after, they, Jeffrey Reed gave a party to two Tavua and Strictly speaking, he spent well, almost the whole night there till the late, early hours of the morning. And what I gather, that he formed from there, instructed his village people, his communists, to go and actually do a roadblock. While the Tui Tabua may be the traditional source of authority in this valley, the real king is Reed. Whenever Ratumara visited, he would stay in Reed's house, overlooking the valley. Reed even has his own special windmill, which directs precious water to his own private swimming pool. That such an important businessman would supply alcohol to demonstrators on a roadblock might seem odd. But the residents of Tavua weren't at all surprised. To them, the company's position has always been clear. Were the people free to go to coalition meetings? No way. They, they were warned, even uh, when these people came to the voting, came for the voting, they were told not to go to the coalition camp, or to the, they were not, they were told not to go through the coalition shed. We have the shed built up for the supporters to go through there, see, where they are supplied with tickets to go for voting. And these people are really afraid to go through the coalition shed. Who, who was telling them that? It was the boss. Jeffrey Reed. We asked Jeffrey Reed whether or not these allegations and others that he had financially supported activities aimed at destabilising the Bavandra government were true. To this he commented, These things may or may not be true. The important thing is not to look to the past but to the future and to what is best for the relationship between Fiji, Australia and New Zealand. Reed was not available for further comment. Reasons for Reed's alleged activities are not hard to find. One might have thought that the rich gold deposits that lie here would have benefited Fiji, but in fact the opposite was the case. The Alliance government had paid millions of dollars to the mine in subsidies. Even so, conditions and pay were far below Australian standards. Unionism of any kind was banned. But the workers of Vatikula had a friend who'd worked as a doctor in the area. He knew from personal experience of their conditions. It was Dr. Bavandra. Because we felt that uh, in, a, in, in a, an organization like that, the people who were working there, uh, working conditions and living conditions, were not uh, really up to the standard that we would expect them to be. And uh, therefore, we felt that they were being given a, a, a raw deal, uh, a lot of unfair treatment, and there was a lot of injustice. And of course, in a place like that where there is no union, the 
people are virtually vulnerable, you know, just cannot do anything. You know, it's the, the, the management is the only authority there, and that's it. And, and, uh, and we also felt that that is an area that uh, should be closely looked into for the betterment of the working conditions and for the better sharing of, of what comes out of the gold mine. We felt that uh, the workers themselves must have a, a better, uh, some better return from the work that we were doing to provide the gold mine, the money and the finance that they were getting. A special interest of Bavandra's was Nosomo village. The people of Nosomo owned their land in freehold. They paid it off by working in the mine and placed it in the hands of the Native Land Trust Board. They were dismayed when Emperor and Western Mining took over part of that land for a new mine in 1984. Not only had the board not sought their permission, but they were worried about the effects of the mining on what was left of their land. Our main concern is the water. Not only that, but uh, you see that uh, not only us that depend on it, but the, our, our livestock uh, as well. You know, of course, I think uh, should this mine go on uh, for quite some time, uh, it's going to affect the crops as well. The people sought the help of Bavandra, who came back with bad news. In 1983, the Minister for Mines and Energy, Peter Stinson, had granted a lease to the company. The Native Lands Trust Board hadn't bothered to inform them. I suppose uh, the joke around here is that Native Land Not Trust Board, you mean? <laughs> it was to Ratu Mosisi Tuisawa, a senior chief and advisor on land matters, that Bavandra turned. He advised Supreme Court action. You know, you got to have your consent in writing as a landowner before something takes place over your land. Otherwise, all uh, processes that follow from that non-compliance, as the lawyers say, are null and void. That's all we're asking the Supreme Court to declare the whole lease agreement as null and void, you know? Is that court case still going on now? Well, still there in the courts, but as you know, the courts is defunct, eh? But Supreme Court action was only part of the bad news facing the joint venture partners. Back in August 1986, the Fiji Labor Party had even mentioned that dreaded bogey, nationalisation. Amongst those that I called for nationalisation was the Emperor Goldmine at Watukula. And why we want to nationalise those industries is because through nationalisation or through in increased participation or ownership by the people, it will bring to you more benefits and it will imp uh, result in an improvement of your standard of living. By the time the coalition platform was finally published, complete nationalisation had been dropped in favour of a worker participation scheme and an inquiry into emperor gold mines. When information about Reed's involvement in the roadblock reached Bavandra, he extended his inquiries. It is, it is very serious and I was very concerned at that time when I was in government of the feedback that I was being told about management in the gold mine going around, uh, organising people to work against the government. Uh, I was very concerned. In fact, I, I was then uh, looking at those when the coup took place. While ministers considered withdrawing Reid's passport, the tension between the alliance and the coalition was growing. Back in April, the roadblock had set off a chain reaction of demonstrations around the country. In the west, they were led by ex-alliance minister Apisa Tora, another close associate of Reid's. Bavandra Tora said was a prisoner of an Indian-dominated cabinet which would seize Fijian land. It didn't matter that the constitution appeared to guarantee land rights. Tora told Fijians to spit on Indians. He was against violence, but if it happened, it was God's will. A few days later, the law offices of Deputy Prime Minister Harris Sharma and Attorney General J. Ram Reddy were firebombed. A close associate of Tora's was charged. Tora himself was charged with sedition. An even bigger march took place in Suva. The Tokay movement had struck a chord. What was worrying the government was where was the Tokay movement getting its money? The transportation costs alone were considerable. Apart from Reed, their intelligence network pointed to another relationship, Bill Poppy and Tora. Bill Poppy is part of United States operations in Fiji. 
He runs the United States Agency for International Development in the South Pacific. From 1984 to 1986, Bill Poppy's small empire had increased dramatically when non-military aid to Fiji tripled to nearly $4 million, most of it going to non-government bodies. I mean, they had a lot of money, clearly. I mean, the, the budget was fairly large. But the other thing that began to emerge very, very early on was that the amount of money being spent by AID was in excess of what was officially being spent. The official budget was not small. Um, but it began to become clear that a lot of the, the projects that were being listed um, on, the, on their official handouts and things like that didn't cover the total extent of their activities, ones that I knew of and other people knew of, where money was being, was being handed out around the country. So there obviously were some other source of funds for them. And they were big spenders, in a sense, in the country. The opposition was even more annoyed when last year Poppy joined an Alliance Party campaign for privatization. I am rather concerned that here in Fiji, and I have here a piece of paper showing United States Agency for International Development, the South Pacific Regional Office, notice on privatization services. While we, this Labour Party, is dead against privatization, the United States is here offering its service to this country and all those who are in, interested in privatization to help them develop this, knowing very well that privatization is not in the best interest of the people of Fiji. They are providing services to help those who are interested in doing this, and that is only the capitalist. This is a very serious thing by a, by a foreign government helping place like Fiji to develop something that is not in the best interest. I call it political interference. And there is no room for such thing here in Fiji. But Poppy wasn't worried by such talk. Just before this year's election, he organized yet another privatization conference with US Ambassador Ed Dillery and a special guest. He is the quintessential man who needs no introduction a senior statesman in the world, in the region, and of course, the great leader of his own nation, he brings a breadth of perspective and judgment that will get us underway in the right direction. The Right Honorable, the Prime Minister of Fiji, Ratu Sirkami Seisemara. Bavanger's victory spelled the end to Poppy's privatization plans for Fiji. When his intelligence network told him that Poppy was helping Abisai Tora, Bavanger summoned the U.S. ambassador to his office. What I told him was that uh, uh, Tora, who uh, was a, a minister in the Alliance government and was at that time a very leading Tauke activist, was heard to have said in, a, in one of the hotels that uh, he was given a large sum of money, amounting to about $20,000, by CIA to see the Tauke activities through. I was even more concerned by the fact that uh, the name of Bill Poppy was mentioned. And I, in fact, told him that this could well be because of their long-term relationship when Apisa Itora was in the, on the rural development and, and uh, Poppy was in charge of uh, rural uh, aid. William Sutherland, the Prime Minister's secretary, had attended the meeting with the ambassador. Uh, he rang back about a half an hour later to my office and said that, yes, there had been a relationship between William Poppy and uh, Abisai Toro, that that relationship did indeed continue after the election, and that he had asked Mr. Poppy to terminate this relationship with Toro. Nor was Dillery's answer about the money entirely reassuring. But certainly what was said by the ambassador was that William Poppy had at his disposal something known as a small grants fund or some such title over which he had discretionary authority um, presumably uh, mr poppy would then have been free to dispense with those funds in the way he saw fit but concern dissipated as the new parliament finally met a top priority in the Governor-General's speech was political corruption. 
And now was the time for the coalition to put words into practice. You must remember that we were only in government for four weeks. And even within that four weeks, we had designed a form for members to disclose and declare their assets and interests. And that was before parliament, the first sitting. We had even uh, looked at some of the reports and we wanted to release the reports. We discussed the reports in the cabinet. And also some of the ministers I'm aware of had already brought out certain files. Who should be in the firing line but two allies? The ex-minister for economic development, Peter Stinson, and Ratumara himself. A new minister, Jupeni Bamba, had taken a special interest in their private property deals. There were a number of clear cases, such as Marella House, the house of the Prime Minister Ratuseka, Mr. Samara, the house I occupied as Minister for Education. In opposition, Bamba had questioned the valuation which led to Mara receiving thousands of dollars rent from the Education Department for the use of this building. Now, as Minister, he had a chance to stop the whole deal. I had already consulted the Minister of Finance to find out if there were other offices available where we could shift into. I know that the Minister in charge for, uh, of rehabilitation was beginning to look at the hurricane relief funds. And he was, uh, it was interesting from his comments that he found that some parliamentarians were building houses, largely from uh, hurricane relief funds, which are supposed really to be used for, for uh, ordinary people who have no means to build houses. For some, it was aid money. For others, loans from Fiji's banks. In Stinson's case, his family company had borrowed $5 million from the National Bank of Fiji. The purpose was a massive development on beautiful Taviuni Island. This land was one of the few freehold sites left in Fiji. The vision was a tropical paradise retreat for the wealthy of the world. But in the end, few houses were ever built. Instead, the project became a disaster for the scores of international buyers whose money simply disappeared before it reached Fiji. Disaster too, one might have thought for Stinson, who'd given a personal guarantee to the National Bank to cover his company's dealings. Dateline has obtained a copy of that guarantee, which left Stinson owing the National Bank more than $5 million. What surprised Stinson's critics was that after he'd executed that guarantee, his wife purchased, through an intercompany transaction, a property worth more than 200000 Four years later, the National Bank had still not executed Stinson's guarantee and the $5 million was still owing. Just as the coalition was about to table a form which would have forced Stinson to declare his assets, Colonel Rambuka staged his first coup. The coup was supposed to prevent violence, but instead it seemed to trigger it off. The answer from the Tokay leaders was that without the coup, the violence would have been much worse. We were about to carry out actions. Uh, not strange to me, because these were actions that other people took in their own country. Uh, I can assure you that we had plans to uh, start disrupting Suva. What sort of plans? To burn and to bring down a few buildings. You were going to do that? Oh yes, oh yes. Oh, it, it had to come, believe in me. It had to come. You know, the, 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 the process normally is, you know, when the balance is disturbed, uh, civil unrest followed by civil disobedience, followed by civil disturbance, breakdown of law and order, violence, terrorism, counterinsurgent warfare, and that's, that's a civil war. And, 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 and we were getting to the disobedient stage. It's all in the name of the Lord. Methodism has always been strong in Fiji but not the fundamentalist variety now taking a grip in Suva's poorer communities. God's will, like the army, is something to hold on to when the only alternative may be crime or poverty. It's fertile ground for Fiji's new political leaders like Ratu Melivesikula. But actually, the ground is not all that familiar. I was watching the situation from England, and uh, I knew that uh, the qualities of uh, the Fijians uh, was uh, going down. 
uh, including he himself, what he, what he produced, and the Fijian person himself, uh, was deteriorating in quality. Uh, that's uh, including sporting uh, results. I knew there was something wrong in the, the, the makeup of the Fijian society, and I knew that my help and experience would be much needed. And um, I came back. The crystal, the mementos, are all reminders of a 22-year career in the British Army. When Rotu Meli Vesakula returned in 1984, with him he brought his stepson, who'd also just retired as a British Army intelligence officer, and a political agenda that seems more international than Fijian. In uh, Cyprus, a uh, military uh, operation was carried out by the Turkish Army. It was quick, it was precise, uh, the casualty was uh, minimal, and uh, uh, a better result uh, came out of that. In Malaysia, on the other end, there was no military op operation, but the, uh, uh, the civilians uh, did the damage, and uh, it was uh, horrid, it was messy. Uh, basically, the Malays uh, uh, blocked off uh, sections of roads, and, and they literally burned the Chinese uh, uh, population alive in their cars and in their homes. Uh, they eventually got their uh, constitution changed, but that's uh, what would have happened here in Fiji. Uh, had it been left to, to the civilians to sort it out. How long would it have taken? Um, I think uh, in Fiji, knowing the nature of the Fijian people and the nature of the Indian, uh, not, not too long, but I, I can tell you it would have been barbaric. But it's a solution that doesn't necessarily make his own English family feel safe, living as they do in a prosperous community. The Vesicoolers moved in here after the first coup. Before that, another man was living here. His name's Rod Kelly. And on the wall of the house, there was a picture of Kelly and a man he likes to call his friend. None other than our own Prime Minister, Bob Hawke. Kelly first used a picture of himself with Hawke in a metal workers' union election, the context in which Kelly is best known in Australia. Rod Kelly is a, a member of the metal workers' union who've caused a great deal of disruption within the Metal Workers' Union over the past few years. Uh, he's been standing for office for about four or five years now. He runs a great deal of material, mailing it out to our members. He seems to have unlimited funds, and we estimate he, at least $2 million has been spent in trying to take over the leadership of the AMWU. Part of that money was spent on a trip to Poland for a photo session with Lech Walesa. Kelly said the money for the trip came from dissatisfied members. There's no evidence anywhere of collection lists being distributed or no member has ever come forward and said he's given a donation to this group. So have you been able to find out where he gets that money from? No, but a couple of years ago we did take them to the federal court to try and find out where their funds were coming from. And we won the case in the federal court before uh, in an individual judge. Then Kelly appealed to the full bench of the federal court. We won that there. So then Kelly appealed to the high court. And unfortunately, we lost the case on the casting vote of the chief justice. Had that have gone through the high court, he would have had to reveal where his money was coming from. The point I'm making, the lengths he went to to prevent it being identified where the finances came from. Kelly's headquarters are in St Kilda, Melbourne, where he rents a suite of offices. In 1985, the Metal Workers' Union became curious about what was going on there. I went there and uh, said I wanted to join the reform group. And the two people in there started to speak in French. And I had great difficulty in following what they were talking about. And then they went into another room and I could hear them talking to Rod Kelly in the other room and uh, they came out and it just led to an argument and in the end I got bustled out, just got tossed out by these two French guys, or they were speaking French. Recently, O'Neill recognised one of those French-speaking men when he visited a building site in Melbourne. He was Brian Hoffman, a Seychellian who fought against independence in Rhodesia. His main aim in life is to overthrow the socialist government in his native Seychelles. He refused to talk to Dateline. At the moment, Hoffman's involved in building industry union politics. The men on the site have nicknamed him ASIO. 
But why he's known as Mr. Azio, he never seems to do any work. He dresses very well for a worker on a site. And uh, he always seems to be in the boss's office as an individual. And he has been seen by workers getting into Commonwealth cars during the day and driving away. Two years ago, Kelly and Hoffman shifted their focus from union politics and flew to Fiji. For Kelly, it was the first of many flights and the beginning of a new campaign. At first, he stayed at the Travel Lodge, the hub of Suva's business world. It wasn't long before he'd become just as much a mystery here as he was in Melbourne. As far as you're aware, who's the person in the photograph? Well, that is Rod Kelly, as I know him, and uh, he's also known as Tony to us. And as far as you were told, what was he doing? Oh, he was here on a assignment. That, that was basically what he had told people. What was that assignment? Or how did he, he describe he, the assignment? All, all he merely said was that he was working for the government here. The Fiji government? The Fiji government. Were there any signs that he was actually doing that? Or was he only saying he was doing well, that? Well, he was... While he was at the Travel Lodge, he, were, he was meeting a few prominent uh, government uh, ministers. And uh, he even on... A few occasions, uh, I was told, uh, visited the government house. Can you name any of the Alliance government ministers or Alliance figures that he was meeting with? Well, he met the then Prime Minister, Ratu Mara, uh, his deputy, Giovanni Baravi, and I think he also met uh, the Speaker of the House then, Tomasi Vakatora. Mark Howard had a different source. A person in the Mara government contacted him about Kelly. A person within the then Prime Minister's office, Prime Minister Mara's office, uh, brought his name up in a, to me, oh, I can't even remember the, the month exactly, but mentioned that he was someone that people should be cautious about, um, that he was involved in some things, and he felt he was involved with the French in some ways, he wasn't sure what it was, and involved in some, some shady dealings, basically. Uh, there were other people around doing these kinds of things, but Rod Kelly's name came up very, very prominently in this particular conversation. It was a clear, clear indication that he had very close ties with the Alliance Party, particularly with the Young Alliance and with other specific members of the Alliance Party, some of the people from Laos, uh, and he's clearly very active uh, in, the, in the Alliance Party at the time, doing work for them of one sort or another, which wasn't always specified, but obviously a go-between and a supporter for various kinds of activities that they were carrying out. Dateline has independently confirmed that Kelly did have a close relationship with senior members of the Alliance Party. One of the South Pacific's most valuable resources is fish, and who should get access to those resources is a highly political matter. Fishing deals were part of Kelly's assignment. A Fiji government official said that he was negotiating tuna deals between the Alliance government and a company called Consortium Development Industrial Commercial Europe. The official said this was a large company run by Kelly's brother in Paris. Dateline was unable to trace the company. Those who knew Kelly and Suva remain convinced that he not only had a family connection in France, but a political one. I knew a friend of his said he was in the country working for the government and that he was a uh, French agent. He actually told them that he, uh, he was French and um, he was in intelligence. Last year, Kelly moved into what has now become the Vesicula's home. Here, he would receive calls from the United States and travel to faraway places like Paris and Brazil. The fact that Australian records don't show this is not surprising. He's supposed to have had a series of passports, a number of them. He carried a number of them. Marcel Bissac was um, the name. Marcel Bissac was in a Belgian passport. Dateline has an independent source who Kelly told in confidence that he was a French spy working for the CIA. In the anonymous hotels and resorts of Fiji, Kelly was well known. But he had more than one identity and a number of occupations pilot, fishing expert, it depended on who he was talking to. 
It was here at the Suva Travel Lodge that I met Rob Kelly in May 1986. I'd first met him a few days earlier at an island resort where he told me he had lots of high-level contacts and a silent number in Suva. He told me he was an Australian trade union official connected with the Australian Labor Party, which he said hadn't decided yet whether it would support the new Fiji Labor Party. He told me the ALP was concerned about the large amount of foreign money which Dr Bavandra had at his disposal. He suggested it came from the Soviet Union. On checking, this turned out not to be true. Kelly's visit here was to warn me that if I publicised the contents of our conversation, he'd be in a lot of trouble. Recently, we tried to interview Kelly in his office in Melbourne. The office is headquarters of an organisation called LAPU, which stands for Labor Association for Pacific Understanding, and SIRA, which we understand is a trading company with links to the Seychelles. I'm describing this. Kelly was most reluctant to discuss his activities in Fiji. You what been... are you talking about? You know who I am, Wendy. I know you're Rob Kelly. I also right. know that you've been using another well, name, Tony. Well, I, don't I don't know what you're talking about. You don't know anything about that? I don't that. know that. I don't know what you're talking about. And if you want to print that, what's going on there? Listen, listen, friend. Just don't do that, all right? right. Just watch it. I'll have a... Wendy, I'm telling you now. It'll what be the are you telling me? I'm telling you to cut that out. I'm not authorised. I'll call the police. Well, why have you been calling yourself a French intelligence agent, people? Oh, I don't talk shit. Kelly, who now works as an industrial relations consultant in the building industry, left shortly afterwards. Twenty minutes later, he was in Carlton with one of his closest associates, Morris Milder. Milder handles Kelly's legal affairs and is also involved in Pacific politics. Until June, he was on the administrative committee of the Victorian ALP and is a vice chairman of Labor Friends of Israel. Milder is only one of Kelly's good friends in senior levels of the right-wing centre unity faction of the ALP. But in Fiji, he dropped the highest names, including Prime Minister Bob Hawke. Hawke wasn't prepared to answer Dateline's questions about whether or not he knows Kelly. Previously, he has denied deliberately posing for that photograph. We do know that one government department in Canberra was concerned enough about Kelly's activities in Fiji to order a special investigation. In that report, the Labor Association for Pacific Understanding is described as a voluntary organisation drawing on the services of ALP members advising foreign governments on business deals. The investigators reported various views of Kelly. Australian intelligence, mafia, or merely a con man. Kelly remained a mystery. But whatever their concerns, nobody actively interfered with Kelly, so that following Bavandra's victory, activities at his Fijian home intensified. Dateline has also spoken to eyewitnesses who saw Fiji soldiers walking in and out of his home. They also recognised Bill Poppy, on the Sunday of the week leading up to the first coup, Kelly was at Pacific Harbour where Mara and Rambuka played golf. On Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, he left for appointments at four o'clock in the morning. The day after the coup on the Friday, he suddenly packed everything up and disappeared. By this time, coalition members were watching the house. When I last heard of him uh, leaving the country a day or two after the coup, in fact, a friend of uh, mine followed him um, with all his equipment to the military camp. Within a few days of Kelly's departure, the coup leaders released Bavandra and his ministers to the relief of their jubilant supporters. After his release, the Deputy Prime Minister Harris Sharma retreated here to the Travellers Beach Resort Hotel. Sharma had been deeply shocked by the coup. I was very surprised, very, very surprised. In fact, I was so surprised that I think my mind stopped working for a while. Sharma was still in this state when the owner of the hotel, George Curran, was approached by two Americans and a Canadian who booked into the hotel. While they were there, one of the Americans produced a document. 
which they wanted Karen and Sharma to discuss with coalition leaders. This document was later to surface as the Tokay's political proposal for a new constitution. The idea was to set up a republic without party politics, which it says fester in urban areas. There will be no vote at all for Fijian Indians. Can you tell me where you saw that document before? At Turbless Beach Resort in Nandi, and it was shown to me by an American gentleman um, who said uh, from memory that he was uh, working in Bunindawa and uh, giving advice to some Fijian chief. Uh, again, from memory, I'm somewhat vague, but I'm almost certain that uh, he did say that he was working in Bunindawa. Why did he want to show you this document? Well, I think he uh, wanted to say that this was one of the ways uh, in which the present crisis could be solved. That, that was his idea of showing the document. And uh, he was quite uh, keen and anxious to show it to me. But unfortunately, I perhaps gave him a cold shoulder and didn't so much interest. Because what is suggested in there is um, ways and means by which a properly uh, elected government could be overthrown. And uh, it gives the nucleus of um, how a Fijian government uh, should be formed. Although there was no name in the hotel register, the American left his name with another hotel resident. It was written on the back of a Canadian professor's card, who confirmed that he stayed at the hotel with a man named Bill Derringer, and that Derringer worked for the United States Peace Corps at the government station at Vunidawa. The United States Peace Corps is another part of the American contingent in Suva. Despite the fact that at least six people remember him being there, Derringer and the US Peace Corps deny that he was ever at the hotel. Then another mysterious American arrived on the scene a few days later. It was Richard Cyrus who describes his views as extreme anti-communist. At the time, Cyrus was still in the US Navy Special Warfare Force, known as the SEALs. Cyrus attracted attention when he was seen at the US Embassy in uniform. I was urged to investigate it as far as I could, which wasn't very far. What I did do was uh, speak to the American ambassador at the time about it. I asked him what the man was doing here, why he was here. Um, I received an explanation that uh, he was here on a private visit. The fact that he had been in his naval uniform and appeared at the embassy was a source of some embarrassment and concern to the embassy because he was retired and it was against regulations for him to be in uniform. In fact, it was not until after that, on September the 1st, that Cyrus officially retired from the US Navy. By then, he was already a vice president of a Fiji corporation called ETO, External Trade Organization. ETO is run by Paul Freeman, whose business activities are spread throughout the South Pacific region. But as he's the first to tell you, his connections go much further than that. This time, I think if we go on this format of who external trade organisation is internationally, particularly I think uh, with Sir Laurie, <coughs> Laurie Francis, with Sir John Falvey, with Dr Larkin in the United States, our shareholders in Australia, the Chinese, the Arabs, the whole thing, there is a much better opportunity for the people at village level to understand. Sir Laurie Francis has known Freeman for many yeah, years. He spent 10 years in Canberra as New Zealand's High Commissioner to Australia. Sir John Falvey, the chairman of ETO, is an influential lawyer in Suva. He was chairman of the Constitutional Review Committee, which followed the first coup. Freeman, like Cyrus, is an extreme anti-communist. He comes from New Zealand, where he was mixed up in a security scandal which rocked its Labor government in 1975. His links with New Zealand's Security Intelligence Service were still unresolved when he left for Fiji. By 1978, he'd struck up a close relationship with Ratu Mara. It was this relationship and Freeman's past military experience which has come in handy since the first coup.
As Fiji's military forces tripled, what Rambuka needed quickly was more weapons for his new recruits. So he sent his second-in-command, Colonel P.O. Wong, Freeman and Mara around Asia on a trade mission, come weapons buying trip. Most of the expenses were covered by Freeman. Exactly what weapons they came back with has not been made public. These crates should have been inspected because there was speculation that they may have contained arms. And some explanation was given by the army spokesman that the crates contained personal items of the soldiers that had gone on this shopping spree. I also questioned um, who paid for their trip and how did they travel first class? Who paid for the freight? But of course those questions were conveniently ignored. Fortunately those days we could uh, express our opinion freely. After the trip, Freeman returned to his latest commercial venture, a timber export plant. It was this plant that had drawn David Watson, its chief project officer, to ETO. But now he's disillusioned with Freeman's new directions. The impression now is that um, uh, ETO is a, a front uh, for, I believe, um, some uh, clandestine operations. I've actually seen um, uh, uh, a commissioned card uh, with his appointment as a, uh, a captain in the um, uh, military forces signed by Colonel Rambuka. He showed uh, you that? Yes, um, uh, not only myself, but um, he's, he's come to the site and um, uh, flashed that card around. Uh, also, in, uh, he's been accompanied by a, uh, a bodyguard from the um, uh, military. Uh, and has flashed a, um, an M16 rifle around. Uh, every morning uh, he would uh, boast um, and say, well, I'm late for the meetings until his secretary, you know, hold him or calls past nine o'clock because I have to attend the security forces um, briefing of a morning. Not only is Freeman in the military, but the military comes to him. It's been quite a, um, a passing parade of um, uh, senior officers uh, coming up to ETO. Uh, uh, people like um, Colonel Wong comes to mind and uh, I believe the man in charge of intelligence, um, uh, Colonel or Captain Matai. When they go there, what do they do? Oh, um, huddle in the boardroom and have these um, uh, secret little um, uh, chats and then suddenly there's a big kerfuffle and they, they all head out of the office. And so it seems to be a, a staging point of some form. Freeman also invited Richard Cyrus to these military meetings. In Cyrus's office were weapons catalogues. Another person who attended these meetings was ex-US Air Force Colonel Larry McKenna. Late last year, McKenna purchased the Kentucky Tourist Resort at Savu Savu. Unlike many resorts which have been downgraded, he's planning to spend millions on improving it. Savu Savu is one of the best harbours in the Pacific and is being considered as the site for a new naval base in Fiji. McKenna told Dateline that tourism is his only interest and the reason he visited ETO was to see Cyrus because he was another American. But he would tell us little about his company, which he says owns similar resorts throughout the United States. The company is big but prefers anonymity. Freeman insists on his links with McKenna. From a safe in the corner, he showed us a large file labelled McKenna, who he described as a CIA operative. Despite McKenna's denial, we are aware that there's at least a business link between Freeman and McKenna. The McKenna file was only one of the hints which Freeman dropped about his American connections. Give me no copy second. Twenty minutes later, Freeman received an official letter from the United States Embassy. It invited him to be part of a coconut products feasibility study in the South Pacific. It's, it's quite ridiculous that we get invited by the United States of government to carry mm. feasibility studies because we know our business. Mm. Yeah. Freeman said he expected to be paid for his contribution to the project. At the time of the first coup, the United States government in Washington suspended all aid programs in Fiji. The only exemption that can be made is if an entire regional program is at risk. Poppy's explanation for the letter was that Freeman was an expert who manufactures coconut cream on Tavuini Island. 
I work for some of those guys. So we visited his operation, but no coconut cream was being manufactured. But we did find Richard Cyrus, who explained anyway, the company's uh, the future plans. Bring the coconuts from the field uh, and drop them down through these uh, the chutes. Uh, when they reach the bottom, there's, there, of course, you have to realize there's more equipment that, uh, that has to be set up here. The, the coconuts are taken from the, the bottom of the chutes over to the tables where the, the uh, laborers husk the uh, coconuts. Once they get the white meat... Cyrus later told us that he wasn't really interested in coconut cream manufacturing, uh, the but that his real interest was in up. weapons and fighting as a mercenary. Like Kelly, Cyrus has now abandoned Fiji. Even Freeman is on a boat somewhere else in the South Pacific. But before we forget them, let's ask some questions. Questions to which there are as yet no answers. Rod Kelly, who's funding him and what organisation is he really connected with? How much did the Australian and other governments know about his activities? Paul Freeman. With him, it's an old question. Is he linked to an intelligence organisation? And in any case, why does USAID continue to be involved with the person supplying weapons to the Fiji military? Bill Poppy. What sources of funds does he have? Poppy says he doesn't know or care about Freeman's past or his military activities. Is he lying or is he merely negligent? Cyrus. Why did he go to Fiji? And what knowledge did the US government have of his activities? Ex-US Ambassador Ed Dillery agreed he knew Cyrus was there. But when we asked what inquiries he made, he said, I can't take it further than that. He was also aware of the relationship between Poppy and Freeman. The shutters have gone down on Fiji. Part of the military's job is to make sure the world only sees what Fiji's new leaders wanted to. When we tried to film them, the military insisted on censoring our film. On Sunday, no activity at all is allowed. It's like all of Fiji has died. No breaking, no burning, no of any kind of things that used to get. The people live without fear. They live in their homes. Because before we know what they do in, during, as a Christian, and on Sunday, they treat this as a business day, as a sporting day, and a travelling day. Then uh, we saw, to me as a Christian, that there is no meaning of Christianity. So when we stop Sunday trading, Sunday sporting. Sunday bus riding and taxi riding, then Fiji comes back to its true colour and true position. And to me, as a Christian, when you respect, respect God's requirement, the foreign reserve or the economy or say it, it is God that will decide. It doesn't matter to Bhutan Jokka that Fiji is devastated that a third of its pine forests have been destroyed. Its tourism and sugar industry on the brink of collapse. That Fijians and Indians who were once friends now look at each other with suspicion. The point of this regime is to divide. Why call it malteration? Because we've been living together for years with the Indians, 108 years altogether. And you know what's surprising thing? The date of the coup, the 14th of May, that makes it the 108th year of the Indian tribe in this country. So there must be something from God, eh? <laughs> it's back to his own people that this humble Prime Minister has been forced to retreat. He believed he could use the ballot box to bring change to Fiji. He's not the first leader to discover that's too much to hope for. Bavandra is crushed, but not entirely defeated. There's one thing uh, that has sustained me right through, and it's the fight for the freedom and rights of my people. I was uh, uh, voted in with a mandate to govern the country. 
And that's exactly what I felt. It had been taken away from me by the coup. And until I get it back, I will have to continue struggling for that right to rule as uh, given to me by the people in the last election.